Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Everyone in the room and everyone virtual, thanks. Uh, it's an amazing opportunity. It's an amazing uh, occasion to be here. Uh, so thanks for joining. Um, first, well, I guess let me just thank first the committee for making it. Uh, uh, we have Jeanette Borg, Antonio Torralba, and Russ Tedrick. They're virtual. Uh, thanks for being here. And uh, first, some procedural stuff. Um, Maria, this is Maria's PhD defense in the mechanical engineering department. And um, she will give a talk for about 45 minutes, after which we will have an open session of questions, general questions from anyone from the audience. After that, um, if the committee uh, feels um, like wants to do it, we will have a closed session of questions just between faculty, research scientists, and Maria. And after that, we'll have uh, just the committee uh, discussion, after which we will invite Maria back into the room to just, I don't know, inform of the committee's thoughts, deliberations. Um, so, um, Maria came to MIT in 2015, in the fall of 2015, for the last year of her undergrad degree in Spain. And uh, boy, I was lucky that she decided to stay for a whole PhD. Um, it's been a fantastic experience. Like, to be honest, like, quite often has felt like a privilege to be able to work with Maria, to learn from Maria. Um, already from that first year as an undergrad, it felt um, uncommonly technically deep and engaging the conversations that we were getting into. Um, so um, it's been um, an honor to be able to uh, work together during all this time. Um, she, um, she has done many things and she has shown like a breadth of interests and projects and collaborations that it would be difficult to make justice here uh, in just an introduction. But I just want to sort of highlight one thing which I thought that um, would be appropriate for today's talk um, among the all of the many skills or superpowers, like I want to call them, that Maria has. Um, she has um, like uh, an uncommonly ability to pay attention to all the many small details that are going on. Um, might be sort of in the results of a very specific experiment or when building a very complex system and putting together many, many pieces. Um, she has that ability to see when something feels off and then ask the hard questions as to how come this is not working perfectly or how come this is not moving to one, to one millimeter away from what it was supposed to. And through that process and covering, I don't know, something that uh, needs to be improved, uh, something that needs to be um, resolved for a complex robotic system to actually do what it's supposed to. And um, she has sort of showed that through many, many systems that she has, she has worked on from large data collection systems to the Amazon Robotics Challenge to picking systems to uh, regrasping systems, a kitting like she will explain today, um, integrating tactile perception, visual perception, grasping, regrasping, motion planning, um, you, everything that, that you can think of. And I think that that is one of the skills that she has that um, has allowed her to focus in her PhD in what she calls precise manipulation, uh, which is incredibly hard to, to work on. So thank you, Maria, uh, for all of this time. And um, whatever happens in the next hour and a half, uh, congratulations for making it to today and now. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Alberto. Um, Thanks a lot for this nice introduction, and thanks everyone for coming today. It's really at the end of my journey through the PhD, and it's fantastic to be here and to be with you. So that I can just give you some sense of what I think um, is the work I've been doing and what I think we can go next. Um, the, my thesis talk is digital perception for dexterous robotic manipulation. So we are going to be talking about robots. And I think many of you, let me just see if this is going. Let me just fix it. Now it's going. Many of you hopefully will agree with me that robots can actually help us in many different types of settings. The question is how do we get them to really allow us to put them into all these situations and get them to do the right job there. 
And for that, I would like to just go back for a second and think, what are the type of robots that we have right now? If you go into an industry, you may see something like this. These are very powerful robots. They can do a really great job. I think that's fantastic. I think we could just say that these robots can be really precise. Now, there is a problem. If you look more into it, what you will see is that usually there is one robot doing one task. And this is actually a big problem. If you look at the 2020 state of, of industrial robotics, what you will find is this. They basically say there is a big problem. You do small change into the manufacturing line, suddenly you cannot reuse the robots. And that is something that we need to fix. How do we get them to be more adaptable? Well, this is industry. Let's go to our houses. And then I would like to show you a very nice robot, but actually the most close thing that we have to a robot is actually something like this, which is good in the sense that it can go into many houses. We can have those in our houses, but it comes with a big problem that is not accurate. And what I mean here by precision is that it will bump into things, it will take many passes until it does its job. So this is not what we want. Now let's go into look at ourselves because we are really good at manipulation. And just to give you some sense, we can do a lot of things. So we can really adapt to different settings and do many things. But to me, it's not just that. There is also the fact that we can do things with the right amount of skill. We can become as precise as we need to. And I would like robots to do the same. Now, I want to build an analogy. Because if you think about it, your phone can do a lot of things. And just 20 years ago, to do all these many things, you will need all these many devices. And again, it's not just that to me. It's also the fact that right now, your phone does it even better than what did used to happen just 20 years ago. So the idea is, can we have a robot that does kind of the same, that can do many tasks and do them with the right amount of skill? This is where we want to go. This is, I think, where we can make progress towards to get really robots into our environments. So I want to go there. But I think there is going to be two axes that we need to traverse to go there. The first one is precision. How do we get robots to have the skill? The second one is going to be adaptability. How do we get robots that can be general enough to go into many settings and solve many different problems? How can we solve this? Well, one way could just be, let's just first aim at complex tasks. Let's solve them very precisely with the right accuracy. And once we know how to do that, hopefully, just becoming more adaptable in general is going to be something that then we can figure it out. Another option is the contrary, which is less for so simple tasks. Let's try to do them in a way that is adaptable. They can work anywhere. And once we know how to do that, then maybe then we can start increasing complexity and become more precise and accurate. And in fact, if you look at today's research in robotics, we do see a cluster. We do see some work that is actually on generality. Maybe it's simpler tasks where data is easy to gather, and then we can do some progress there. We have also seen some progress on more complex tasks, but then what you need is a lot of data, very good models, and only then you can make some progress in those directions. What I want to argue is that for us to make progress in research, it might make more sense to actually think about those, precision and generality, when we try to make research. Because if we go through the middle, there's going to be actually, I hope, many more solutions that will bring us to the top of that plot. And ideally, we want to do this. We all know that in practice, it looks like that. And I'm using this as an excuse to tell you that I myself went through that, right? When I started my PhD, I was working on precision. I was working in this type of systems, which is a robot pushing an object. And as you can see the, here, it can do that with a lot of precision. So we can get these models that can really allow us to push an object accurately through a trajectory. But this comes with a problem. And the problem is that those models only work for this object and actually even for just this surface. So you make a change, it's not going to transfer data. So we got precision, but at the cost of generality. And I realized that after some work, so I went back into thinking, how do we get generality back into our systems? And for that, I will just mention then the Amazon Robotics Challenge, because it was the perfect example where you do now get a lot of generality. Now you get a robot that can deal with many different objects, for instance. But if you look at it, again, it can only do that. There is not a way for us to reuse some of the components in that system and put them back into different robotic solutions. So today, what I'm going to do is tell you how I think we can do perception. Perception means understanding our world 
in a way that is more reusable, such that we can get still some generality and some precision. And once we have done that, I will move into, well, let's put now this into a real robot. Let's get a robot to do something that is both general and precise. And now, actually, I'm going to do something that Alberto mentioned once, which is spill the beans fast. And I'm going to show you what is the kind of end result that we're going to do, where we go building towards in this thesis. So this is what we're going to see at the end. We're going to build a system that is capable to do this, handle many objects, and place them very precisely into a given location. So this is what now we are going to make progress towards. We're going to have this system that is capable to precisely understand where objects are, precisely manipulate them, and finally get them right into the configuration that we want them. The question is, how do we get this system that is adaptable and can do all these all this tasks? But before going into that, uh, let me just talk about what happens when you only think about generalization. And I'm going to do that in the context of the Amazon Robotic Challenge. As Alberto know, this was very important for our lab. It was all our lab working on this system. And the question that we had to solve is very simple. You have this bin. It's full of objects, many of them the robot has never played with, has never interacted with. And the question is, how do you get to pick them all? How do you get to empty this bin? Well, we were a large team. You can imagine 15 people. We built this system that is very complex, and it can do a lot of things. But what I want to show you is this. So the system works. We actually want the stowing test. And here you can see how it goes into the beans and just picks the suction grasping into many of these objects. So this solution does work for many objects, even ones that are new. But it comes with some problems. For instance, all it knows how to do is grasping. If you ask it to do something else, it doesn't have the capability. Its perception system actually only knows how to say, this is a good grasp. But also, there is the fact that objects are being dropped. Like now, I think once it gets this bottle, it's just going to get thrown away. And this is happening for all the objects. So looking at the system that took a lot of effort, I felt there were still some questions that we wanted to answer. Some of them is, what are we missing here? How can we make this system better? And I think one of them is reusable perception. The tools that the robot is understanding, the things that it's understanding, can we reuse them for something else? So we are going to aim to build this type of reusable perception. But we are also aim at getting contact information. And this is very important. As you could see before, the object was dropping because what is in the hand, it had no way to sense what was going on in within the contacts that it was making with objects. So this is actually very important. And if we have access to the contact information when we, make, when we grasp an object, then we can actually aim at more textures and more fine manipulations that, again, have a sense of how do we get more precision. So we are going to work here into building these general and accurate perception models that use both tactile and vision. But I just want to mention that in, it was not immediate, right? And actually, in my thesis, there is first some thoughts on how do you use tactile for better grasping an object. So that's what we call tactile regress. And there were some thoughts on, OK, if I have an object, can I just touch it a lot, get a model of it, some mapping, and then use that model to localize it? And that worked. It just meant that you had to touch a lot the object before you could do anything with it. So now we are going to go into this idea, which is we are going to build these models in simulation, but still they will, be tra they will transfer. We are not going to need to have a lot of data, but still we can do good perception. So let me motivate this a bit more. Now we're gonna I'm going to present you Jess. She is blind, so she's not going to be using vision. She's only going to be using tactile. But I want you to pay attention, because basically, she's going to be able to get an object, understand what it's supposed just with tactile, and then actually show you how to use it. And to me, that is remarkable, right? Just with your touch, you know exactly what the object is, so you can just show how to use it. This is just another example. This is a bit more subtle, but just to emphasize the idea that just with tactile, we can do a lot. So in this case, I want you to look closely at her hands, because she's just going to understand what is the pose and make a very smooth regress. So here you can see she knows where it is. So with ease, she can just move the object from one hand to the other. So to me, the question is, how do we get robots to do kind of the same idea, right? How do we leverage tactile to do that? Well, this is what we call tactile localization. This is our system. And now I want you to pay attention, because I'm going to take an object, this one, and I'm going to touch, touch this finger. And what you can see there at, at the corner top is the tactile image. This is an image that comes from a camera that is within the finger. 
and basically shows us the deformation of the membrane. As we touch this finger with an object, the membrane deforms, and the camera basically records this deformation and gives us these tactile images. What is tactile localization then? Well, it's just, if I give you this image, can you tell me the pose of the object? And in this case, it turns out that you can do it. If you look closely, basically you can just say, if this is a tactile image, the object must be contacting the sensor at this location. But now I want to show you another object. Now I'm going to use this one, and we're going to get these tactile images. Same question, where is the object if I give you that image? Well, it turns out that there is more than one option. As you can see here, if you only get the tactile image, you are not able to tell if it's this pose or if it's the other one. And this is because this is what we call a non-unique contact. This is a contact that could come from many different object poses, and we need to acknowledge this. If we want to use tactile, tactile is local. So how do we understand and leverage the fact that there's going to be ambiguity? Well, in our solution, what we do is, well, let's think about pose distributions. Rather than say, this is the pose, let's say, these are the poses that are more likely. So now, what I'm going to do is just this. We're going to make an assumption. We're going to assume that we know the object model. And with this, we're going to build this general and precise perception solutions that will give us post distributions, not single estimates, and will not require any real data. So let's go into it. Assumption, we have the object model. Because we have it, now we can compute contact poses. These are just poses where the sensor and the object are in contact. Once we know these contact poses, next thing that we do is generate, render, did simulated contact images. You can imagine those as binary images that when there is black, basically means there is contact. Now this is what we do in simulation. What do we do in the real system? Well, we have this sensor that I already showed you that gives us that tal image, and then we have a calibration neural network. This is a neural network that doesn't need to know what is the object. So each object is independent, and only does it tell us where there is contact, where something is contacting the object. And now going back to simulation, Simulation is object dependent, we really need the model. But the key idea is that now we just have to solve a matching problem. Simulation comes from free, is giving us these contact images, and all we want to say is which of those contact images is more similar to the one that comes from the real sensor. And if we solve this matching problem, then we are able to provide a distribution of possible contacts that can explain the one from the real sensor. So let me just go in more in detail on what I mean by matching. How do we do that? And the idea here is that at training time, that means in simulation, just with simulated data, we are going to get, we are going to compute a dense set of contact shapes. This means that now we're just going to simulate a lot of contact poses, get these contact images, and this is going to be a large set of those. Now we're also going to generate a one randomly, and now we're going to ask the question, which of those is closest in pose distance to the one that I just generated? And this is going to give us a label all zeros for the one that is closest. Now that we have this, the next thing that we do is we embed those using a neural network into these encodings. Why? Because these are the smaller representations of our images. These are easy to handle. And once we compare them, this is just, oh shoot. Okay. <laughs> once we compare those encodings, what we can get is actually a distribution. So this is a predictable likelihood. This is telling us each of those elements, how likely is it to explain to be the closest one to the one that we generated randomly? And if we had this likelihood, we can compare it to the label, and now you can imagine just solving an optimization, propagating, and training this, ResNet, this neural network here. This is happening in simulation. Now let's go into the real system. Into the real system, we have already computed those encodings because it already came from simulation, so you don't have to do that. All you have to do is the following. Take the image that comes from the real sensor, do a forward pass on the neural network, get its encoding, compare to the other ones, and you already get a likelihood. Again, this likelihood is telling us which ones of those contacts is more likely to explain the one that you got from the real sensor. And for instance, we can just say the one that is highest, in this case is this one, is the best match. It's the one that better explains the information that is coming from the real sensor. And this is important because now we get these distributions that are actually pose distributions. Now we finally got a distribution of object poses given just some tactile information. Okay, how well does this transfer to the real system? With Tony, 
we have actually done some experiments, and I want to show you how we can actually transfer these models into the real system. And we're going to do this first by showing you just one example. This is one object. Just for size, this is 10 millimeters on that object. And now, if we run our algorithms on all its possible contacts, what we get is that our error in average is 2.5 millimeters. So this is pretty decent. Just to give you a better sense of how much this is, it means that the error falls in within these two. So just to give you a sense of, in average, how well we do with this object. Why is that the case? Well, this is the case because this object has many unique contacts. You get a contact that is only one pose that explains it. For instance, this contact, if you get it, there is only that pose that explains it. But now, actually, this is not the only case. There is many objects for which this is true, and we can just get very good transfers from simulation to the real system. But if we look at this object, then everything is different. Because this object actually has a lot of non-unique contacts. For instance, all this middle region, if you make a contact there, you cannot distinguish them. So what happens in practice is that you get a really high error if you just look at the best match. Because you cannot really tell what is the right answer. And unfortunately for us, many objects fall within this category, where many contacts are actually not unique. So how do we solve that? Well, distributions. Just again, let me just show you another example. Because I think non uniqueness are sometimes not obvious, right? In this case, you're getting this context. Our best match seems very good. But actually, the poses that can explain these matches are very different. So we end up having a very high error. Because those contacts are, again, non unique So we want to think, how do we solve that? And for us, it's going to be, let's just have four distributions. If we assign high likelihood to both of them, our robot should be able to reason over both and make better predictions and decisions. So now let me just show you how this works in practice. How do our distributions look like? This is a case where we're making contact here. And our tactile images look like this. Well, all these contacts actually would actually give you the same exact tactile images. We have a problem there. Because we're getting post distributions, actually our algorithm can tell us well, I think everything here in the middle, everything that looks green, is actually capable to explain you this pose. So if you were to be a robot, you would be like, OK, I have no idea. But at least I know I have no idea. So I can now do something else based on that. Instead, there is this other case. Now you're just grasping at the edge. The edge is very exp it gives you a lot of information. Our algorithm is confident there is only one region that you can see there in green that can explain. So if the robot is there, I may just say, oh, I'm good with perception. I can just move on and do something else. So this is what we call an observable grass, but grass that is unique. Therefore, we get a lot of information out of it. And just to show you even more things, in this case, you are at the orange contact, but the purple one looks the same. So in this case, we have bimodality. There is two regions separate that could actually explain you this contact information. Well, these are things that we can now capture. The question is, how do you leverage them? One way could be with a prior. If you had maybe some vision that is giving you some extra information of the post, some kinematic information, you have a prior that would say, you only have to look better. And if you only have to look in some region, for instance, for this case, you would know exactly what is the post, right? So this is what we have done. We just consider a prior. And if you use a prior together with our tactile estimates, then you can really reduce the error, as you can see here. And just to give you a sense, if instead you were just randomly, instead of using tactile, you would just get my high, much higher errors. So just to say that using post distributions can really help us get better estimates and exploit the resolution that tactile offers. And just going back to the example, before we were using, we were getting this from just using the best estimate. Now that we can combine it priors with our post estimation, with our post distributions, we actually can get the right post and much lower error. So again, we can leverage post distributions to really narrow down where we think the object is. So this is tactile localization. And again, we are using the idea that matching can really help us transfer into the real system. But this is working for tactile. We have also shown that it can work for vision. So in this case, we have this depth image. And I know it's hard to see, but basically the question is the same. Can you tell me what is the pose of this object that I just marked in yellow? This is the question that we try to solve here. Can you tell where is that pose? And the pipeline is exactly the same. You just take, in this case, a crop, and you get that image. The question is, where is the object pose given that image? And in simulation, we just get some object poses for which we can render again depth images. And now all you have to do is solve this matching problem. 
the same way that we did for tactile. You solve it, now you get again a distribution that is a post distribution, so now you can easily combine this post distribution with the one that would come from tactile. So this is the summary for perception. So our tool basically can give us uh, good estimates only using simulated data, no need for real experience. It can give us meaningful post distributions that we can leverage uh, in the system. And finally, we can use the same tools for different sensing modalities like vision and tactile. So now we have perception. How do we put this into a bigger system that does actually dexterous manipulation? This is where we are going now. And the test that we are going to try to solve is called pick and placing. Sometimes I will refer to it as kitting. And pick and placing, the way it works is the following. You have objects in an unstructured way, and you want to be able to pick them. Once you pick them, the next thing that you want to understand is where they are within the robot's hand, right? So we're going to try to localize them. And that means answering the question of what is the pose of the object with respect to the, uh, the robot. Once we know that, then ideally, we just like to go and place it at a given configuration. The problem is that sometimes, depending on how you grasp an object, you cannot just go immediately and place it. So we may need to do what we call a regress, change the object configuration so that I can really go into the placing location. And this is a very important problem. Because in industry, often they will have something that they call kit. They want to put this kit full of the objects in the right known configuration, because then this can go into a machine. But because now there is a lot of objects, they don't have the generality. They cannot build a system. It's general enough to actually make these kits. So what you can imagine happens is there is someone assembling these kits, doing the pick and placing that we want to do. And as you can see, this person now is doing the regress so that he can just go ahead and place the object. Well, what we're trying to make now is actually, can we make a robot help in this situation? And this is our system. Here you can see how it's first going to go for this pick. Then it's going to make contact. It's going to use vision and tactile to localize it. Now it understands what is the pose. So it can just go ahead. In this case, it does one regrasp. And finally, it can just go and place it very precisely at the configuration that we tell. We want the robot, the object to be exactly in this position. And this solution is going to be general, because we're only going to make the assumption that we know the object shape. And we're going to need to really experience anything with the object. You give me the object for the first time, the robot is already able to go and precisely place it. And it's going to be precise, because we are going to leverage the perception tools that I just explained to you, but also something that we call task awareness. So let me just now go into the details of what I mean by task awareness. I mean, the name already says it, right? You want to know that in the end you have to place the object. So how do you use that information to actually guide all the actions in between? And especially, we're going to be task aware for the case of picking the object. So the first thing that you want to do when picking the object is pick the object. So if you try to do that grasp, it's not going to work. So definitely, you want to think about how do I make a grasp that work. But there is a few more things that are more subtle. Like for instance, now we're going to go for this grasp here. And once you're making the grasp, you're going to get some contacts on that grasp. And we already know that some contacts are bad. They are non-unique. Well, that's the case for this, for this context. Those are non-unique, so what happens is that you go into a perception failure, where the robot thinks the object is in that location, but it's actually in the other one. This is because the context that we decided to exert on the object when making the, con the pick were not good enough. They were not unique. So if you were to choose, you would rather not choose to make a grass there. And the final thing is that you need to move the object from one location to the other. You want to simplify this motion. So that means that if you take this grass, for instance, you are making contact here, and you want to place it in this green region there, you will need to regrasp in this case. So that means one grass, a second one, and now you can go ahead and place it. Instead, if I show you this other one, it's a grasp in a different location. Now you can only do one regress to place it. So one regress, and you are good to go. So if I ask you, if you were to choose which one you would prefer, I imagine that most of you would just say, let me just do one regress, let chances of making a failure. So we are also trying to encode this when deciding what is the right grass for the robot to make so they can finally go and succeed at placing the object. So now we're going to put everything together. And I'm just going to show you how everything builds in so that we can have this precise pick and placing. 
First thing the robot does, gets a depth image. Looks like this. Second thing is answering the question, where can I grasp this object? So a few proposals, a few options. That we combine together with the fact that I have already shown you that with depth images, we can estimate the object pose. So now we combine these two, and we do what we call a grass selection. As you can see now, some of the grass have turned green, good, some red, bad. And green and red means based on the task awareness. So basically, we're trying to find what are the grass that make us happy. Where well, happy again means the grasp is going to succeed, perception is going to be easy, and placement is going to also work, and it's going to be simplified. We take the best one, and we just execute it. Now that you have made these graphs, you're actually getting tactile images. And as I was explaining to you before, if we have vision and tactile images, we can combine them and get a better pose estimation. Now that we have this pose estimation, we can just go ahead and compute what is the right motion plan, and then we just execute. Hope for the best that the robot is going to be able to place this object. The important part here is that all these parts of the pipeline are only learned in simulation, and we are trying to transfer them into the real system. So let me just show again how this works in practice. So here you can see again how the robot is just sampling several grasps. In the end, it's going to commit to one, and it's also going to identify what it thinks is the object pose. Now, once it makes contact, it's going to be able to refine and improve the object pose based on the tactile images that you're going to see there. As you can see, there, there was a slightly change in the object pose because it has been refined. And finally, we can plan what is the right motion so that then we can just execute it and get the object placed into the right configuration. And to me, what is important is that we can do this for many objects, and we don't really need any real experience. We just have to be based on simulation. So let me now just show you some results. This is the robot just taking some of these objects. In this case, it's everything, every time the same object. But it can just identify different graphs, select the best ones at every time, deal with collisions, and manage to place these objects into the given configuration. So I think this shows us that we can get some set level of precision. But we can also get generality, because we can deal with many different objects. This is 15 objects that we have tried and we have run results. This is a penny, in case you can see it, just to give you a sense of the scale. And to me, what is important is that by combining tactile and vision, we can really handle small and big objects within the same system. We run 20 trials for each of them. And here you can see how many times we succeeded. It's not perfect. There is cases where transferring becomes really hard. But in many of those cases, we can really achieve very, very high success when transferring into the real system. And just to show you the first video that I show you, this is how everything put together now fits in, right? We have all these objects. We don't know where they are, but the robot will figure out. And then it's going to make the right motion so that it can place them very accurately into the given configuration. And as you can see, it's going to aim for graphs that really allow it to make these placements. Um, and it's going to also have to reason about all the collisions and all the motion planning. Another thing that to me is kind of the elephant in the room when I give this presentation is that so far we have assumed that we knew the object model. And that's an assumption that might be true in an assembly line where you have just manufactured your objects so you exactly know how they look. Like you already have a CAD model or something that tells you what is the shape. But in my kitchen, you will not have access to the, actual, the perfect model that you have. So we have made some progress into that direction. I'm not saying this itself. I'm just saying that we have tried to make some progress to show that there is hope that these tools can even work for objects that immediately you don't know the object shape. And for that, what we have done is use 3D reconstruction. We use a commercial 3D scanner. We put the object data, and basically we get this noisy model. And for tactile localization, we have compared what happens if you use the true model or the noisy one. And what we have seen, again, noisy one, but not too bad. Um, and what happens in the end is that the pose estimates are not that different. The errors that we are getting from noisy or from actual objects are rather similar. So this, again, gives us some hopes that we can actually use this in more unstructured settings. We've done the same for pick and placing, where, again, we have just now used in simulation the noisy model to train all the models. And still, we can see that we can transfer it and get good results when doing pick and placing. So as a summary 
of pick and placing, I just want to say that it's been very important to have good perception models to really be able to understand where the object is, together with task awareness. If you remove this task awareness, you can get yourself into bad situations where there is no solution even on how to do the pick and placing. And finally, it's been important to use simulations so that now we can have the same system that works for multiple objects without extra effort, without, like in industry, you have an engineer, you change the object, you have an engineer come and change the system. So we are trying to make some progress towards not having to do that and allow more adaptability. Um, again, the goal is to keep making progress towards this idea of getting robots to be closer to more precise generalization. And I just want to share with you some of the key findings, some of the things that after my work I think are important and relevant for me to share now. So one of them, again, is the idea that simulation might give us some tools to actually make progress into the real systems. And here, I want to stress that matching has given us much more better results than what could be regression. Regression would just be, I give you the fractal image, you just tell me the pose. Instead, by, with doing matching, what we have done is, you give me the actual contact, and I give you a few options, and you tell me which one of those is more similar. And this has worked better because even if there is some noise, in the real image, the one that is closest is still the right one. So we have found that for transferring from simulation to real, using matching has been much more useful than other approaches like regression. This tactile perception has allowed us to combine both um, the strengths of tactile and the strengths of vision. So tactile is very high resolution, vision has a global view. So putting those together really allows us to make manipulation for many diverse types of objects. And finally, I think probabilistic reasoning is very important. We all know that in robotics, but I think for tactile, it becomes really essential. Because as I was telling you, there is non-uniqueness, there is ambiguity. If you don't think about it in a way that is probabilistic, you might not be able to resolve many situations. Well, if you keep track of some of those probabilities, then you have the chance to really understand and make use of tactile. OK, now some limitations. Um, I do think we need to do more work on closing the loop between simulation and real. Let me explain that. We do everything in simulation. We put into the real system. Real system fails. We are very sad. We do nothing. I think there is a lot of opportunities for us to bring this information back into the simulation. One way could be, can we have probabilistic uh, simulations? So that now, instead of saying, this system is going to give me this observation, can we say, this system is going to give me all these noisy observations so that then I can plan with those. So the key idea or the main idea here is how do we close the loop and just don't stop from sim to real and just go back and feedback this information to improve also our simulation. Now, this is something a bit subtle, but I think it's important. We have found in our experiments that sometimes vision is not confident enough. Title might be sometimes overconfident. So when you put these probabilities together, you actually struggle sometimes to get the right estimates. And I think that hints at the problem of calibration. How do you make sure that vision is the right amount of confident? So that if title is also confident, when you put them together, you get the right answer. So the idea here is that there is still some problems in calibration that I think we need to look at. And finally, there is the fact that at some point in Keating, we had these beautiful probabilities that we have been using for perception. And that's why we say, well, I don't know how to handle this probability. Let me just take the best estimate and do motion planning with it. So at, point, at some point, we just discarded the probabilities. I think that's a problem. I think you want to carry those with you. The question then is, with how much resolution? If you take with you the whole um, distribution, it's going to take you probably one hour to an hour just going to come and say, why is the robot so slow? <laughs> so you don't want to do that. But if you only take the best estimate, that's also not going to work, because in some cases, you're just going to have a failure. Then we might just say, oh, just take the three or four that is more likely. But there are also some situations that are not that likely, but they could be very dangerous. So we really need to find a good trade-off. So I think there is room for us to make more work in this. I think something like filtering, where you do keep track of your probabilities over time, you try to make actions that just reduce them, so that you can say, now I'm sure, so I'm willing to commit to a single solution. I think this would be a way to address this, but I, I do think there is more work for us to do in this direction. And that's it in terms of context for robotics. Now I'd like to move on 
into just thanking all the people that has been around during my PhD and that has really made it be a really fun experience. So I'm going to start with Alberto. Many of you know that Alberto is a fantastic person, a fantastic professor. I've been really enjoying doing my PhD with you. One thing that I wanted to share is that when I talk to people in my lab, it always feels that there is a sentence like this. Oh, Alberto is not pushy at all. He doesn't force me to make work. But I want to do it because I want to make him happy. <laughs> <laughs> and I have felt a bit the same, right? So you can probably imagine that it has been really fun and really engaging and motivating to be able to do work with Alberto and learn from you. Another thing that I wanted to say is that Alberto sometimes says things so well that I'm just typing them and then just putting the exactly in the text. So uh, that still amazes me. Um, and just a fun picture of you. Because um, <laughs> I just wanted to say that I have been really fun and I have really enjoyed it. Um, so thanks, Alberto. OK. Then I also wanted to thank the thesis committee. Because maybe let's wait for this to get fixed. Well, thanks a lot, Ross, Jeanette, and Antonio. Because I think we have met a few times. But I think to me it's very remarkable that some of the questions that you make really made me feel like I have to do some improvements. And I have to work on some of the directions, like making some plots of distribution to make sure they actually were giving us the right things. Um, or looking into other more baselines. So I know that there has been some contributions here that now to me are very useful that they wouldn't have happened without you. So I'm very thankful for all your advice and all your support in this process of just making sure that I could get into today and make this presentation. Also, thanks a lot to everyone that has been involved in all the projects that I've been making. Like research takes a long time, but if you make it with people, it really makes a big difference. I have really enjoyed working with all of you. I have learned a lot for all of you. So thanks a lot to everyone that has been working with me. Um, also to the people that I've been able to um, somehow guide into some research problems and have some fun together. Um, you know, when you have. When you're a mentor, you learn more probably than you meant to. Because there is a lot of things on how do you explain something, how do you build a nice research project. So I've been really grateful to be able to help and work with all of you. Um, also, lab mates. Um, many of you are already here. But some of you already left because, you know, by the end of your PhD, some, half of the people is already gone. Um, <laughs> I love the lab. Like, the lab shaped the way I am. I remember coming into the lab and learning a few things. One of them as obvious as when the lab may succeed, you end up succeeding because it means that the lab is going well. So that's something small, but to me it meant that we really team together and we really want everyone to succeed. So it always felt like we are all in this together. And to me that has been very important and I'm very grateful for that. Plus we have been having a lot of fun, like conferences, outgoing. So Thanks a lot for being there and making the lab a really great experience. Also, some photos from, I just call this PhD life. There is a lot of people in here. Um, you get to know people in conferences, in fellowships, around the campus. The Calm Lab is also a very good use tool. So I'm very thankful for all of you for having had you around during these days. Spanish community. Um, you already know that the Spanish community makes you feel at home. And I've been able to experience that with all the Spanish community. We have done a lot of things like tapas, going to the beach, playing a sport. So thank you, everyone, for being there. I, it really makes the experience much better. Um, a special thanks to Harvard the Street, just for context. We used to have two apartments. We used to have a lot of people living together. So I think overall we had like 15 people if you count everyone. So actually, I had to put two slides of people from Harvard the Street because it was really fun. And we ended up doing a bunch of things. Um, so thanks, everyone, for being part of that. Um, also, something that I've been discovering, which is I can play soccer even though I'm not good at soccer. Uh, <laughs> so thanks, everyone, for having patience with me. And also to all our friends in the volleyball. Like I don't think Alberto knows that I've been going to play volleyball sometimes two hours a day. Um, 
So as you can imagine, soccer and volleyball has been a really good and amazing part of my life. Also friends from my undergrad in Barcelona, like from France friends to a lot of people from our undergrad. Um, we also had a lot of fun there, so thanks everyone for that. Going down high school in Menorca. <laughs> so also like, I really want to go back to Menorca and one of the reasons is just because to see you all. So thanks for that. Extend the family. I have my family, parents, but also I have my Konku, my Padri, um, and Falit, and also Ferran's family that in the end is treating me so well that they needed to be in this slide. So thanks everyone for this. My brother used to be like this. That's my memories of him. Now he's this big guy. Um, he's so much taller than me. It's OK. Um, thanks a lot, Josep. Um, I really admire you. And I think you don't always know that. But my brother is the most calm, relaxed person. He doesn't worry. Like, I envy you for being able to do that. So thank you. I, I don't know. I really like that. Um, my father, he's very funny. He makes me laugh a lot. And he has been also very supportive. So thanks a lot, father, for being there all these times. Um, I think he's the one that put me into liking mathematics. So I think everything started from that. And then my mom, which is, as you can see here, she's my biggest support, together with Farhan. <laughs> but she's the one that is, she's just going to be an hour on the phone, and I'm just going to be explaining her everything. So she has been always supporting me, even like just five minutes before. She's like, you're going to do great. Um, thank you, mom. You are the best. Um, and then, of course, Farhan. And I started looking at pictures of us, and there were just too many, because this journey has been almost 10 years now since everything started. So I just decided to center on this one. Because I think it shows how happy you are making me and how happy I can be with you. Uh, you have been a co-author, you have been a friend, but you have also brought so much joy. You have made me feel that I could do this, even in times where I really felt like, ah, uh, maybe not. So you have given me a lot of support, and you, you have made everything be much easier and happy. So thanks a lot. Um, Okay, that's, that was a lot of acknowledgments. I just have one more left, just as a funny, uh, funny side, which is I want to thank all my robots, because many things went wrong <laughs> many times. And just to give you an example, this was the other day, and the robot was doing its job, as you can see. But I made a mistake. I just asked, can you place the object in the same exact location? And the robot was, yeah, sure, I will do that. <laughs> And I think it shows two things. One is that we make mistakes, but also the fact that robots are still a bit blind, right? The robot's not like, are you sure about that? He just went ahead, right? So there is still some room for us to keep making progress. And to me, that's really exciting. Uh, so with that, I would like to take any questions, if you have any. And thank you all for coming today. That. <laughs> um, let me ask also, by the way, someone remote, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. Oh, John is going to go first. Okay. Very impressive. Um, I know. Uh, tell me a little bit about some of the math behind the scenes, because I'm <laughs> sure there's a lot of math and a lot of data under yes. this. Uh, what, what, would, um, what are some of the kind of key, what's one key lesson there? Yes. So I was talking about the matching. And the matching is using tools from contrastive learning, where again, the question is, can you tell if this is a positive example, negative? So we have used those, some of those tools, and we have repurposed them to actually be able to work for our approach. And some of the tools that we use is something like um, Docker's Entropy Loss so that we can make sure that when we do our probabilities, we can actually get well-defined probabilities. So we have taken these tools from contrastive learning that are, allow us to just do unsupervised learning, turn them into a supervised problem, so that now when we do a softmax, what we get in the end, because of the type of loss that we are using, is a well-defined probability. So this is something that has been very important, because otherwise, you don't have a way to measure how similar this is, how dissimilar this is, in a way that is meaningful. 
So this is some of the tools that we have been using to make sure that this could work and give us sensible. Um, and if you look at the math, I have some math here, actually. Just, yeah. This is kind of the loss that I was telling you. And basically, what it allows us to do, I'm just going to put everything here, is that if there is two contacts that are non-unique, this actually allows us to not penalize when you predict the one that is not wrong. Basically, it allows us to convert everything into a meaningful probability. In this case, what I'm trying to tell you is that the way this loss works is going to say, OK, if you tell me half the time is this, half the time is this, you are good to go. You're not going to get hurt by this. And this is important to, again, then get meaningful uh, distributions. Thank you. I'll ask a question if, it, if people can hear. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Ross, go for it. OK, sorry. I, I think Alberto maybe said we could hear, but I couldn't hear Alberto. Um, yeah, so I thought the question I thought John might ask, you have some work on tactile slam. Yeah. You showed at the end a reconstruction with an RGB camera on a turntable in order to build your model mm -hmm. and do the task. Um, I mean, obviously, it would be harder to do that from tactile slam. But I wonder if you could tell me what, you know, what are the gaps, what are the challenges right now to just doing that whole thing end to end, well, sorry, forget end to end, from tactile only. Let's say I go and I build an object model using my tactile sensors, and then I complete the task using the model from the tactile slam. So I think that's a very good question. Um, I think one of the things that you're going to face is at the beginning, you're going to be in a complete state of uncertainty, right? Your contacts might be ambiguous. They're just going to give you something that is very local. And then you're going to have to decide what are the right actions. So I'm not going to say it's not possible. I think starting that to build a model in a way that it's sensible might take you some effort. But at the same time, because in our previous work, when we fix the object, so now the object is not moving, that gives us an advantage, we could really get good reconstructions. So I do expect that something where you're trying to maximize the information that you're gathering, together with making sure that the object doesn't fall, could actually give you an opportunity to make sure that you can get those models. The question to me then is, how do you get those models at the same time that you improve your perception models? Right? That you might have a model that tells you, I think this is the shape of the object. Another one that might tell you, I think this is the, lo the localization, that how you would actually understand and just kind of make this land a part of post-estimation. How do you frame those two together? You can, and I know there is some words I trying to do this as an optimization. So I don't think it's impossible, but if you want to do it tactile alone, I think it's going to be time consuming. So I would definitely go for a vision tactile approach to solve that in a practical setting. Because vision definitely gives you much more information much more rapidly than what tactile can give you. Tactile would just take a very long exploration to really get good resolution data. Thank you. I had a question. Um, so I guess it's a two-part. Uh, first, like, how big is the range of like how difficult it is to localize an object? So like, are there objects that are like really easy to localize versus like ones that uh, like you can barely localize at all? Like, how big is that gap? And two, like, do you think there's some role that like optimization can play in like if you wanted to co-design like an object? Like, how would you do it? Or like, yeah. is do you think it's worthwhile? You know, any thoughts? I like that question a lot. I, I do think it's worthwhile if you really want to think, this object is going to go into a robotic system. For instance, can we put some features that that could leverage? But going back to the first question about distribution, we have found with Tony that you can always build an object that just screws your ideas of what, what, what is going to happen, right? We have found objects that vision really doesn't know how to do something with the post. Title needs to come and help. Objects where tactile is just a complete mess because there is so many ambiguities that it really doesn't help at all. It can even just confuse vision if vision is not confident enough. So I think the spectrum is is big. But I would also want to say that so far, this solution is kind of open loop. We are not aggregating information over time. I think once you do that, even if there is some uncertainties, you're going to be able to reduce that and just make sure that you can actually understand and localize objects. So I do think. This is an, a first step, but there is more to go into and, um, aggregating information that will probably help you solve even challenging objects. And then in terms of adding features, yeah, sure. If you know you're going to make contacts somewhere and you put some features in there, Tactile is going to see them. 
So that's going to help you have even more fine resolution. So I would think there is a lot of room for making that, especially in industry where you want precision. So if precision means adding some features done in manufacturing, that seems very worth. Thanks. Oh, uh, are there more questions uh, in the Zoom? Okay, um, I'm gonna ask a question. Um, if there's something that you could change about the kitting system, um, add, um, um, like improve in terms of manipulability or in terms of sensing, uh, what, but you could only change one. What do you think is like the, the bottleneck in terms of performance in its ability to do accurate pick and place? Hmm. More than one comes to mind, to be honest. Like, I might change the robot. Um, <laughs> But I think I'm debating between two, so I'm going to say both. Motion planning is harder than expected when you don't want to do collisions and you want to do things as smooth, especially with these two arms. Like, they start doing like this, like all the time. And it's like, no, ju just, just do this. So that, if you do it naively, takes a lot of effort and really slows you down. So having some better tools to make, like we use the standard tools. We haven't built that. We have libraries. I think that will help a lot to just not be the bottleneck sometimes because you just see collisions and motions that don't make a lot of sense. But if I wanted to think what is next, right? What is the thing that I would improve for this system? It would definitely be feedback. Like right now, you come in between, you change the object pose, you just touch it a bit, robot is not gonna react. And you can be naive and just say, I'm just gonna keep um, just doing data localization, you can do some tracking. But even at the end, when you really need to be precise, that is when feedback is really important and needs to come very fast. So that you can just make sure that if you're making a small mistake, you're correcting for that. So I would really like to have the capability to have this, this feedback information coming, having motion planning be fast enough to change whenever it's needed, whenever the post had changed sufficiently so that it makes sense to replan and make a change. So if I were to say this is open loop, and it's nice that it's open loop because we can really show that even open loop, we can get to do something very precise. But if you wanted to put this into industry, I think having feedback would really make a ton of difference and would make us just, we had a lot of near failures. You get very close, but you don't get exactly there. Those would probably get corrected just by that. Great presentation, Maria, thanks. Uh, I have a quick question on, um, so we've been showing robots at the graphs very, like uh, in general, small pieces. <laughs> Um, but as you said in the beginning, there are uh, robots that might be working as well in, uh, fact in car factories where the pieces yes. might be bigger. How easy it is to, for the vision system to scale uh, to larger? Uh, so you, I think you're, you're using one camera each side. How <laughs> easy it is to uh, y the design the sensor that uh, can grasp bigger objects? So actually, I think that vision will have an easier time than tactile. Because imagine you have an object like this and a sensor like that. Like that's a very much harder problem. I think for vision, you could probably aim at um, having more than one sensor. So you can get a more uh, global view of the situation. And people do that. People may have several cameras, integrate uh, all the information so that you can have a scene understanding. So you can actually really get to see that object. Um, but the tools that we have shown, I think they are not dependent on the type of camera. So you could see a camera that's just high up, so you can really see the object. And still, we will be able to use them. So I think for vision dimension is less of a problem, as long as you can ensure that some part of the object is going to be visible. Um, I think you're still going to be able to capture most of it. So I think you can work around that. Tactile is when I think you're going to struggle the most, because you cannot have a tactile sensor like this. So you're always going with this. So the question, I think that goes back to Orion's question of, well, if you have big objects and tactile sensing, 
what are you going to do? You're just making contact in one small region of the whole object. If you had features, then maybe you could do something better. So this is something to think about, especially when you get into really big objects. Um, you may need to be even going into the design side to make sure that your tools will transfer data. But I think in terms of the matching approach and the simulation, that I see that it would be possible to work with big objects as long as you know how to simulate the sensors that you're using. So I have kind of a follow-up question of from course. my next question. Um, not so much regarding the size, but the, the stiffness of the object. Like mm -hmm. It seems like all the objects you show are like very yes. stiff. How, how does the deformation of the object when you apply pressure will change the, adaptability, uh, sorry, the generality of the solutions that you're proposing? So uh, that's a great question, and it goes back into what if you update the forms, right? What happens then? What I would say is that because right now we don't have, we are not simulating deformation, that would be something that immediately cannot come into. But what I do see is that most objects that are deformable, they are not fully deformable, like t-shirts, things like those, they have buttons. They have some features like corners that you could actually be able to detect. So you might try to make contact like task awareness. Can I just go into the button? And now once I am into the button, then I know that with matching, I can actually understand it and localize it. So I would say that in this situation, still some of our tools can work because then you might just want to focus on those regions where do you, you know that you're going to get some meaningful information like a corner, a button. So if I were to think about deformation objects, this is where I think this approach would make some sense. Can I aim at regions where I do know that I will get useful tactile information so that then I can actually perceive and understand the object? Thank you. Uh, so, uh, if I remember correctly, you were, uh, the robot was that uh, you worked with was manipulating maybe like 15 or 20 different objects. <laughs> How much harder does the problem get if you have a very, very large set of objects? Uh, or, yeah, as the set of objects grows, and does this actually matter in the real world? Like, uh, in the real world, a robot's just touching a small number of objects or a large number? You mean when you put them in the scene, or you mean in terms of learning the model, just to make sure I am... Uh, learning the model. So, because now, okay, that's a very good question, and I want to clarify that. We are learning a model per object. So if you have a thousand objects, you're going to have a thousand models. So therefore, it's not a problem of training each model. It's model is just whatever time it takes, and you just do it, and it's as precise as it is. It's just that now you will have to actually run maybe a thousand models so that you can really say, okay, this is the grass that I want to do next because it's the one that is looking the best out of all the options. So I think you're probably not going to see a 1,000 objects. And even if you did, it would just take more computational time. But in terms of learning, it doesn't matter because you are learning one model per object. So you know exactly how, time is, how much time it's going to take per object. And then if you then have 10, if you have 1,000, that doesn't make an, a difference. What it would be important is then when you try to say, what is the model that I have to use, this kind of object identification. That is where we have done it very naively. If you want to do it better, then I think you might want to just be able to say, First, I identify the object. Then I just know that I have to use this model. That would be where that matters more. Thank you. This is a question. Um, so nice seeing you again. Um, so you were mentioning how with the visual perception, you have some issues with uncertainty. So I was wondering if you have made some optimization on like having more um, visual sensors and how that kind of affects the model and like time and efficiency and um, at the end of the day how accuracy yeah that's actually a very good question because I don't think we have thought too much about how multiple visual sensors reduce uncertainty but now that you mentioned I think they would right um, the problem is that the way we are now solving this this is not a joint optimization per se, right? We are just saying each sensor is going to have its own distribution. And then we're just going to use Bayesian tools to combine all these distributions. What that means in practice is that your input is not all the possible sensors. You just have a model per sensor. So what this means in practice is that they are, when you are learning things, you don't know that vision is going to be used together with tactile and together with another vision sensor. I think that is a problem. Because then it means that everyone learns how to solve the problem on its own. And then at the end, they get combined. I think if vision were to know, oh, there's going to be another camera, 
that is going to be maybe giving me, me another angle and is going to give me this information. I do know that in this situation, I will be able to resolve the pose. So I think this is something that we could do where aggregating multiple sensory information at the beginning allows them to understand that in these situations, I'm going to get some information, and therefore, I will be able to resolve the pose. I think that would help calibration and confidence. But this is something that we have not explored. And I do think it would be important to really ensure that every sensor is at its best when we're making a prediction. Great. Um, I don't know if there are any more questions. If not, we, I suggest that we move to the closed session with faculty and uh, research scientists. Anyone here? Thank you.